Okay, so this video is going to be complementary to the first one I did on the derivation of the Schrodinger equation in the framework of scalar relativity. Uh, this first video, you can find it on my, cha my channel, and uh, I did it using a, a specific extension of a specific uh, classical mechanics framework, which is the hamilton jacobi framework. Um, originally, not all the derivation is a bit different. What it does is that instead of taking the framework, the extension of uh, uh, the hamilton jacobi formalism of classical mechanics, he uses the Newton's second law of dynamics. And then he used uh, uh, the covariant principle, uh, that is a very important principle in uh, theoretical physics, to transform the Newton's second law of dynamics into the Schrodinger equations. So that's, so that's what I want to show you, how it is done in the scalar relativity original work. Okay. So what I want to do first is, just like for the previous video, I want to do a bit of um, classical physics. What I want to do is to show you how the framework of uh, Newton's second law of dynamics is related to the framework of the Hamilton-Jacobi formalism I discussed previously, because it's most of the time it's a framework that is not well known by uh, the people doing uh, basic physics, uh, mecha classical mechanics. We usually use either Newton's second law of dynamics or Euler-Lagrange equations or Hamil Hamiltonian, uh, uh, Hamiltonian physics. Okay, but the Hamilton-Jacobi equation is not used a lot. I mean, it's not very common to see it. So let's just see how we go from how we connect Newton's second law of dynamics to the Hamilton-Jacobi formalism. That's what I want to do first. So I'm going to write that as from Newton to Hamilton Jacobi. Well, that's what we do today. So let's start with uh, let's start with the Newton second law of dynamics. You can write it on as the derivative of the velocity with respect to time is equal to minus the gradient of some external potential divided by the mass of the particles. That's Newton's second law. Now what we are going to do is that we are going to add to this the idea that the velocity is the gradient to some quantity, which we call s, divided by the mass of the particle. Okay, so we are going to take those two equations and we are going to see them how we can transform this equation, the equation for uh, the second Newton second law of dynamics, into the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Okay. So how does that work? Well, by expressing v as a gradient of some function s, which is both function of well, maybe it's important to write it now, s is a function of time and position. What we can do is to basically develop, expand this total differentiation here. Let's do that. So when we do that, here we have what? So up, up, we have that the total derivative of v with respect to time, it is the total derivative of the gradient of this quantity s divided by m, and then we expand the total derivative we expand it as the partial derivative with respect to time of this thing, gradient of s divided by m, plus velocity, scalar product, with uh, the gradient of this quantity. Let me see if it's right. Yes, all of that is right up like this. So that's what we are going to get. So now we can then connect that to the gradient of the potential that we had. So we have that. Uh, what can I do also? Maybe I'm going to write that all in components. It's going to be a bit easier to manipulate. We have that partial derivative with respect to time of um, dk of s divided by m plus um, v, let's say, j derivative with respect uh, to the j component of uh, some gradient also here, dk of s divided by m. And this is equal then to minus 
dk phi divided by m. Okay, so that's basically Newton's second law that we developed with the uh, relation between the velocity and this quantity that is actually the action we discussed in the previous video. So now, if we want to arrive to about Hamilton's Jacobi uh, equation, we have to basically put out one gradient. Okay, we want this gradient to disappear. We want to integrate over that gradient. So how can we do that? Well, here the partial derivative with respect to time and the partial derivative with respect to space, they commute with each other. So for the first term, what we can write is that we have dk of the partial derivative with a parenthesis of uh, s with respect to time, and we have our 1 over m. Huh? 1 over m. Okay? Let me what, write the 1 over m inside. I'm going to put it like this 1 over m. Okay. Then, here, what we can do is to re express this velocity here as the gradient of the action again, divided by m, okay, like this, times dj, dk, s over m, like this, okay, minus gradient of phi divided by m. Now, let's look a bit more into the details. What we can do is to take here this uh, um, partial derivative, the k, the k partial derivative here, make it commute with this partial derivative uh, j, because partial derivative they commute. So we have dk 1 over m partial derivative of s with respect to time, plus, uh, let's write it down like that, 1 over m squared partial derivative of s, like this, dk, and then here partial derivative s is equal to minus partial derivative k phi divided by m. Okay, now we are almost done. What we can do with this term here is to write it down as 1 over uh, 2m squared uh, derivative, the k derivative of the basically the, 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 the square of the gradient, like this. That's how we can write it down. And this equation then can be written down with uh, maybe also by multiplying by m on both sides. By m is a constant factor. Then we are going to have that the gradient of all of that, partial derivative of s with respect to time, plus uh, 1 over 2m, the square of the gradient of s. Uh, -bum -bum. Let's put the, also the phi on uh, the other side, plus uh, phi is equal to 0. That's the equation we obtain. And integrating that yield the Hamilton-Jacobi equation we were supposed to obtain, of course. And that's how you make the link between the Hamilton-Jacobi equation and Newton's second law of dynamics. And if we want to be a bit more precise, I'm going to box that, of course. But if we want to be a bit more precise here, that is just up to some constant. But this constant of integration can be put inside of the action without affecting um, the link between Newton's second law of dynamics and Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So this constant is not important. It can be incorporated in a redefinition of this action S. Okay? So why am I doing that? Uh, it's really to see the continuity between um, classical mechanics and its extension to non-differential physics, scalar relativity. Okay? It's really to see to show you again, to stress the fact that scalar relativity is just an extension of classical mechanics, right? An extension where we allow trajectories to be non-differentiable. Okay, so in the next part, I want to show you 
how with tools of scalar relativity we can transform Newton's second law of dynamics in a covariant way. I'm going to explain what it means. Uh, we can extend it in a covariant way in such a way that we can transform it into the Schrödinger equation. Starting point is very similar to the starting point of the link between the Newton uh, second law of dynamics and the Hamilton Jacobi equations. We have Newton's second law of dynamics. But in the context of scalar relativity, we have to extend the concepts of velocities of total differentiation for the quantities that are involved in Newton's law of dynamics. So for that, I reference you to the video I made right before, okay, where I develop how non-differentiability of path really affect total differentiation and affect also the very concept of velocity that is doubled, right? And this doubling uh, leads, leads us to introduce complex numbers and then complex quantities like a complex velocity. So here I'm going to call what I'm going to do from Newton to Schrodinger. Okay, from Newton to Schrodinger. That is the original derivation of the Schrodinger equation uh, from uh, Laurent Nuttall's work. Okay, so this derivation is very interesting in itself because it really uses this principle of covariance. Covariant, covariance means that um, if you want to introduce the effects of the geometry into your differential tools, it has to be made in such a way that the fundamental equations that describe dynamics are unchanged in their shape, in the way you write them, right? So for example, Newton's second law of dynamics, it's quite of a fundamental equation. So I'm just going to rewrite re -write them. dt v is equal to minus the gradient of some external potential divided by m. Okay, now we have this arrow where we want to incorporate non-differentiability. When we incorporate non-differentiability, we have basically two things that we have to extend. We have to extend the concept of velocity that becomes a complex velocity. And we have to extend also the concept of total time differentiation, which is extended, extended to the fractal derivative. Okay? That's what we have to do if we want, if we want to add the... Um, non-differentiability to uh, the non-differentiable geometry into the game basically okay what else we also have actually i forgot to uh, put it even though it's not a straight uh, forward we also have that the action the uh, function s is extended to a complex complex function uh, that i called curvy s okay so both v big V here and uh, big S here, they are complex. They are complex values. Okay, so basically what do we mean by covariantly generalizing? We mean that, okay, covariantly extended to, we mean that we replace the total derivative by the fractal derivative, we replace the velocity by the complex velocity, and that's it. That's the law, Newton's second law of dynamics that we are going to consider. Up, this equation here is the one we are going to start with. Okay, so that's the covariant extension of Newton's law of dynamics. And then to that, of course, we have that the complex velocity is the gradient of some complex action, complex scalar function. And from those two, what Laurent Nuttall did is that from those two, you can prove that uh, this Newton's law of dynamics is integrated into a Schrödinger equation. So let's do that now. Um, I need I need a third ingredient in order for the, 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 the derivation to be perfectly right. Because if we want this to be transformed transform into the Schrodinger equation, we need the wave function. In my previous video, I showed that the wave function can be introduced as a redefinition of the complex action. 
just take the exponential of i times the complex action divided by 2md, okay? And you remember this d here, it's the diffusion length parameter uh, describing the amplitude of the non-differentiable uh, uh, fluctuations, okay? So I'm going to also take that into account in my derivation. So let's go. Let's expand first the fractal derivative of the complex velocity here, like this. We have that, the fractal derivative. It extends the usual concept of total differentiation, time differentiation, by adding some second order space derivative. So we have partial derivative with respect to time of v plus the complex velocity scalar products with the gradient of the um, complex oops, velocity, here like this, minus i times d times the Laplacian of the complex velocity. Okay, now what we do is that we uh, rewrite v in terms of the complex action and mostly the wave function, okay? So we have here the wave function. I'm going to do some work a bit before uh, rewriting that down. So with this relation that I just wrote between the wave function and the action, it can be inverted. I'm going to put it here, actually. It can be inverted, and we can write down that the complex action is basically minus i 2md, the natural log of the wave function, okay? And I'm going to use that to simplify a bit the calculations. So basically, what can we write down then? We can write down that this is equal to the partial derivative with respect to time of v, that is the gradient of the complex action divided by m. OK, I forgot the divided by m, by m here. So if we replace the complex action by the relation to the wave function, we then get the term minus i to d. Um, mm -mm, gradient of ln of psi, like this. Okay, so that's for the first term. Then we have plus and it's going to become a minus, I think. It's going to become a minus because we have v, we have going to have two factors of minus i multiplied with each other. We are going to have, um, pa -pa -pa we are going to have basically 4 d square, 4 d square, because you have two velocities. so. You're going to have two times the action, uh, the complex action appearing, and it's linked to the wave function. So you're going to have those two multiplied with each other, and then those 2d also multiplied with each other. And then we're going to have, let me write it down, gradient of ln of psi, scalar product with the gradient of the gradient of ln of psi, like this. And then you're going to have minus i. Alors, this minus i, I think it's going to also cancel out with another i. You're going to have minus i times minus i here. It's going to give you minus again. And uh, minus, you're going to have 2. You're going to have a d square. The m is going to disappear. And then you're going to have the Laplacian of just the gradient of ln of psi. Okay, that's basically what we obtain. Okay, that's a bit of a long expression. And if we want to reduce it a bit, we are going to need to use to work in components, because without, without that, it's going to be too much of a mess. So we're going to work in uh, components for the gradient expression for all the partial derivative with respect to space. So first thing we can notice is that this partial derivative with respect to time and this partial derivative with respect to space, they can basically be switched with each other. And so in component, it's going to be 
uh, written down as decay of and if you apply also the differentiation to the ln of psi you're gonna have minus i to d times one over psi partial derivative of psi divided with respect to time okay like this then here what are we gonna have i'm gonna write it down in terms of components so we're gonna have the let's say j and then psi uh, d j and here let's write d k and then of psi like this and the last term we are gonna have minus 2d squared d j d j and here dk ln of psi like this okay can that be a bit worked on yes here here those two here this term it can be a bit worked up look this partial derivative this jf component partial derivative can commute with this partial derivative so those two they can basically be exchanged so we can write this as minus 4d squared dj ln of psi dk and then we have dj ln of psi okay so that's good what can we do more well this thing can be written down as minus 2 d squared dk of basically the square of the gradient of ln of psi like this that's what we can write down okay so that's for this part that's for this part then this part it's easier we can basically just um, uh, make this uh, partial derivative k component partial derivative commute with all the rest so we have minus 2d squared dk and then we have here basically the laplacian of ln of psi like this okay now let's all of that be put together a bit we have then that this expression is uh, dk minus i 2d 1 over psi let me put a bit more space um, d psi dt minus 2 d squared dk um, the square of the gradient of ln of psi like this and minus uh, 2 d squared um, dk and the laplacian of ln of psi like this okay now this can be of course be put into we can factor out basically the partial derivative with respect to k and we are going to have then just partial derivative with respect to k of all the rest okay all the rest uh, let me write it down maybe minus i to d uh, one over psi d psi dt and here then what we can do is to factor out the 2d squared and to put uh, gradient of ln of psi squared plus laplacian of ln of psi like this okay lastly the thing we have to do is to maybe a bit uh, develop this expression if you apply the differentiation basically you're gonna obtain here the gradient of psi squared over psi squared and here what you're gonna have is uh, the laplacian of psi divided by psi minus the gradient of psi squared divided by psi squared and then those two they are gonna basically cancel out so finally we can rewrite this total time derivative of the velocity as a gradient it's the gradient of minus i 2d 1 over psi d psi dt minus 2d squared the laplacian of psi divided by psi 
Okay, so that was quite a bit of work again. But we arrive to a much simpler expression in terms of psi. And finally, what we need to do is to just put all of that equal to the external gradient of the potential here. Okay, so Newton's second law of dynamics for non differentiable trajectories. In the case where we allow for non differentiable trajectories, how can we write it down? We can write it down as um, the gradient of all of that minus i to d1 over psi d psi dt minus 2d squared Laplacian of psi divided by psi. And by putting the external potential on the other side, we also have uh, plus phi over m is equal to zero. And here we are now. We can integrate this equation, put this term on the other side, and then prove that. So, um, and we can also multiply by m. Okay, let's uh, then also multiply by m and uh, put uh, this term on the other side. Okay, and then we obtain that i two m d. Um, d psi dt okay there is also the one of psi okay but once you integrate okay let's just do the step one of psi uh, da, 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 is equal to minus 2 d uh, 2 m d squared laplacian of psi uh, over psi um, plus phi okay that's the equation you obtain and also now you can just multiply by psi on both sides and obtain i 2 m d d psi dt is equal to minus 2 m d squared replication of psi plus phi times psi and that is the schrodinger equation again so that concludes the link between Newton's second law of dynamics in the context, in the um, uh, context of scale relativity, how it can be transformed, integrated into the form of a Schrodinger equation. But this Schrodinger equation really is just an extension of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation of classical mechanics, right? It's just an extension of it by allowing path to be non-differentiable. And to be more precise here, again, just like what we did before, this is up to uh, an integration constant. constant. But this integration constant can also be uh, incorporated in a redefinition of the wave function that doesn't modify fundamentally the uh, description of the system it basically it can be incorporated in the phase of the wave function in that situation and that doesn't change anything about what we can uh, extract from it uh, from our wave function we want the probability amplitude so uh, since you square and take the mod modulus it doesn't matter this integration constant what it um, what it is okay so that concludes this complementary video of the one i just did uh, before uh, that's the way it is originally done by Laurent Natal. And it's really, really interesting because here we really insist on covariance. Okay, this principle of covariance that is, again, like I said in the first video, we are guided by general principles instead of axioms. Okay, and the principle of covariance is one of them. We extend geometrical concept and we suppose by covariance that the equations are unchanged by this uh, extension and then we see what we get and usually it works and that's what uh, we do also in uh, general relativity we have also newton's law of dynamics that is unchanged in shape but the differential operator is changed in order to incorporate the effect of curvature okay and here if you take into account the effect of non-differentiability well you get quantum mechanics from classical mechanics and that's really 
the key point of this derivation. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed.